Today I'm joined by Hugh Parker, who is the Operations Director for the A1 Steam Locomotive Trust and is working on 60163 Tornado whilst it's doing mainline excursions. Hugh, thanks very much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Tornado is already famous for being the first standard gauge new build loco in the UK since Evening Star. Today we're going to be talking about uh, another sort of famous event in Tornado's life, but could you give us uh, an outline of what Tornado is to anybody who hasn't heard of it before? It's uh, an A1 Peppercorn Pacific locomotive from the LNER or the London Northeastern uh, Railway. It was built and completed in 2008. And since then, we've been operating around the UK on mainline tours and visiting uh, preserved lines uh, throughout the UK. So this was a landmark event. No mainline steam locomotive had been built in the UK since Evening Star. That's right. Yep. And we, we, we were the first. Uh, when the project was first started, uh, the, the, the doubters said it would never happen. It was not possible uh, to build from scratch. Uh, a, a new steam locomotive and you know, people should be focusing their efforts on restoring the heritage locomotives many of them uh, even today many of them still in another you know, scrap condition and we were told it couldn't be done i wasn't involved during the build uh, of tornado i came along much later after they had been operating i was fortunate enough um, i'm based normally at the Thlangothlin railway in north wales um, one of the very successful Steam, Steel and Stars events uh, managed to encourage uh, the A1 Trust to bring Tornado. Uh, and I was very fortunate to be rostered to drive the locomotive on several days during the event. Uh, met the guys that from the support crew that, that looked after it and was invited to go and join them uh, for a run on the main line. Uh, and you might say I've never looked back. <laughs> Things spiralled from there. They could Indeed. see keenness when they saw it. <laughs> so in April 2017, Tornado took part in a pretty landmark event for steam traction on British Railways, 100 miles an hour. Can you tell us how that idea came around and why? Yeah, indeed. Uh, we're limited normally to 75 miles an hour on the main line. Uh, as the main lines around the UK get busier and the available paths for steam charters um, get fewer, uh, we need to be able to operate at higher speeds in order to be able to fit into those paths. So our, our long-term plan was always to build a locomotive that could operate up to 90 miles an hour uh, on the main line. Uh, the 100 mile an hour uh, came about uh, as a result of the testing and the proving that we had to do to demonstrate that Tornado was fit and safe to operate at that speed. So we had to demonstrate a 10% overspeed, which would have been 99 miles an hour. The, the planners in Network Rail realised that 99 miles an hour would be just... Uh, tempting fate and said look you know we we know you will want to so we will authorize uh, up to 100 100 miles an hour uh, and that was the proving test run that we did in April 17. So do you think that steam traction on the main line might be seen by some as a burden because it can only go 75? It's certainly pathing is certainly a challenge and getting in and amongst um, you know um, peak passenger services on many routes is now becoming impossible. Uh, and even some freight traffic is traveling now at much greater speeds, uh, which again just restricts the number of paths to allow steam excursions to operate. When a date had been set, what were the preparations needed specifically for this speed run? Or did you do several runs beforehand that's kind of led up to that? No, uh, there, were, there were no previous runs, although on, on the day or on the night, should I say, um, in the northbound direction, we built the speed up gradually uh, and the intention was always to go for the 100 um, on the way back, um, uh, which is in the end what we did. Um, but in terms of preparing the locomotive and operating at gradually higher speeds, no, we didn't do that. But we did have to go through a huge amount of paperwork exercise to demonstrate that on paper um, all the systems were safe, that we had particular dispensation to operate up to 100 miles an hour for the test run. And we put in place a number of uh, other systems and checks um, to prepare the locomotive specifically to operate at higher speeds. Why was the test taking place at night? At night, there's much less traffic around, so there were more paths available to us. And uh, th that simply, that, that was the reason why we did it at night. There was a BBC documentary made about this uh, speed attempt. 
And in the documentary, you can see that the coaching stock is quite modern. Was there a reason behind that? That was simply the the stock that was available to make the run. Uh, at, the, at the time, uh, there was still an issue of uh, or concerns about Mark One coaching stock operating behind steam at 100 miles an hour. Um, but that was uh, a stock that was put together um, very kindly to allow us to, to make that run. Um, it was stock that wasn't necessarily in normal use and therefore didn't need special treatment and was was available to us. Um, more importantly, wasn't required the next day for something else. What was your experience of the night? You were on the footplate. Uh, I was, yeah. I, I, um, I took the engine north from York um, to Tyne Yard um, near Newcastle. Um, but prior to that, I'd been with the engine during the day with um, the, the preparations, the fitness to run exam that had to be done. Um, making sure that the engine was fully prepared uh, for the run that evening. Well, I, I joined the footplate at York and we had uh, a, a schedule of activity to, to make sure to meet on the way north. So we had to uh, demonstrate that uh, that braking from those speeds um, was safe. So we conducted a brake test on the way north and uh, we built speed up gradually having left York and we managed uh, on the northbound run to reach 91 miles an hour. So I managed 91 miles an hour on the footplate of a steam locomotive in the UK, which was quite exciting. On arrival at Tyne Yard, um, we gave the locomotive um, and a fairly careful inspection to make sure that all was well, both mechanically uh, and I spent the time whilst our engineers were going around the outside of the locomotive, oiling and inspecting. Um, I cleaned the fire to make sure that um, uh, the fire was in the best condition it could be. Uh, for the return journey when we were going to go for that 100 miles an hour. Having um, a, a been at uh, Tyne Yard and whilst I was cleaning the fire, uh, the rest of the support crew um, topped off the tender, refilled the tender with water and we put some more coal uh, in the tender ready, ready for the return back. Um, once we were happy, uh, we then handed the locomotive back to um, our operators, DB Cargo, uh, and the crew joined the footplate to, uh, to ready to take the engine back south. Um, with great anticipation to, to go for that 100 miles an hour. Before we could do that, we had to move travel forward into Newcastle to turn. So we turned the whole train. On the way north, we'd had a, a diesel on the back, which uh, we left behind at Tyne Yard um, after we'd turned. I think it was, I think we had a 67 on the back. Okay. Uh, and again, that was, that was there to assist with the turning move uh, prior to the locomotive heading south. I handed over to Graham Bunker James, who is our commercial director, and he had the pleasure. Uh, he's, he has been involved with Tornado since they finished it, or just before they finished it in 2008. Uh, and he had the honour of, uh, of being on the footplate and bringing the engine southbound uh, and making the attempt at that 100 miles an hour. And were you in the support coach at that time? So yeah, we, we changed roles whilst I was on the footplate as the owner's representative supporting the footplate crew. Uh, Graham was the responsible officer and running and conducting operations from the support coach. Uh, when he stepped up uh, onto the footplate, I took over as the responsible officer for the run south. Did you feel a bit like you were channeling the spirit of Sir Nigel Gresley's team in the dynamometer car during Mallard's run? Well, there was certainly a great deal of excitement. Um, and you'll see from Tom Ingalls' uh, documentary about the run, uh, uh, the run south. Of course, whilst the dynamometer car at the time was the way of verifying uh, speed and um, uh, draw by horsepower, uh, we had far more sophisticated pieces of equipment and almost everybody had a GPS on their iPhone or their iPad and was watching the magic figures uh, climbing upwards. So can you uh, take a step by step through once you'd left the yard, what happened after that? So yeah, we, we, had, we knew that we had three attempts to get the engine up to 100 miles an hour. The first attempt uh, was running south um, uh, uh, in the Darlington area. Um, unfortunately, we had to reduce our speed when we were routed through the station rather than down the fast lines at Darlington. And so that was the first attempt missed as we had to check speed to go uh, through the platforms in uh, in Darlington uh, through the station. Nice as, it, nice as it was to be taking the engine through her hometown station. The second attempt, uh, again, would have been further south um, and uh, we ran out of railway with a speed restriction uh, at the end of the section where we thought we could get 100 miles an hour in. So finally, sort of in the North Allerton area, uh, on the run back down towards York, uh, somewhere around Thirsk, um, was the last attempt to get to that 100 miles an hour. And um, as again, as you'll see from Tom Ingalls' documentary, it, the, the figures very slowly climbed up 
from 98 miles an hour until we hit that magic 100. And what was the reaction of the coach at the time? Well, there were two coaches. We, we had a, a, a coach of um, invited guests um, and people with an interest, engineering staff, etc., to witness the event. Um, but we had our own support crew in the support coach. Um, and there was elation from both vehicles uh, when that uh, 100 mile an hour was reached. Fantastic. And then, I mean, did you even sleep that night? Uh, no. Uh, because uh, we uh, we ended up getting back to um, Doncaster and into Roberts Road, which was the depot that we were using in the in the less than early hours of the morning. And again, once the engine was back on the depot, there was an there was an amount of um, disposing, making sure that everything was um, safe, uh, and fastening the engine and coach down, uh, leaving it ready for its next next turn of duty. So, no, it was a case of looking after the engine first. I think I slept on the train on the way back to Bristol. <laughs> So this event was not widely publicised. No one really knew when it was going to happen um, outside of the Tornado's own team. Was that because it was a test train or was that to avoid people bystanding taking risks as we've seen with Flying Scotsman? An element of both. Um, uh, we, we, weren't, we weren't sure, for, first of all, we weren't sure exactly where we were going to achieve that 100 miles an hour. So we weren't advertising that we would be doing 100 miles an hour on this particular stretch of railway. Um, there are too many variables involved to to be able to forecast that you know with any certainty. Um, the the date could have changed for a number of reasons at the last minute. Um, the biggest threat perhaps being the locomotive passing the fitness to run exam, uh, which was you know, more stringent and, and much more thorough than um, routine exams because we were going to be putting those extra stresses uh, into the locomotive. So, you know, on the afternoon of the run, had we not passed the fitness to run exam, we wouldn't have made the attempt. So a number of factors at play, not just because uh, there was it was it wasn't so much secrecy for the sake of secrecy. Um, and the, there was no obvious attempt to deceive people and say, well, it's not it's happening or it's not happening. Um, that was just the way that it was. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember there was a, a significant amount of buzz around it at the time and everyone was trying to second guess where Tornado might appear next. Does running at this speed place much additional strain on the locomotive? There's certainly a, a, a great deal more of effort involved um, in getting it up to 100 miles an hour. She was very comfortable, you know, getting up into sort of the, the early 90s. But um, that extra, you know, five miles an hour from 95 to 100, um, as the fireman on the evening will tell you, uh, was a significant effort in terms of you know stress on the locomotive itself. Uh, I mean, in in steam days, they were regularly running at high speeds, and specific engines were selected for high speed runs, and they were you know more more carefully tuned and given lavish ex sort of that additional or lavished that additional of engineering attention to make sure that they were in the best um, you know best condition to to run at those higher speeds. In April 2018, Tornado suffered a failure to the centre motion. A fairly catastrophic failure to the middle engine, yes. Yes. Um, was speed a factor in that? Well, it was on the first um, booked 90 mile an hour service uh, and the incident happened just as we'd reached 90 miles an hour and the engine was settling in. She'd run, to, run at 90 for a, a brief period of time when the crew on the footplate started to feel that something was awry. Um, the initial indications were a, a, an unusual vibration, uh, and then that started to transmit into a very significant vibration through the um, reverser stand uh, on the locomotive. So they realised at that point that something pretty serious was wrong and started to take steps to bring the train to a halt. Uh, in the end, it got so severe that they made an emergency brake application and brought the train to a stand. I was the uh, duty responsible officer uh, on that train and myself and the duty engineer once it was safe and we'd taken a block on the line next to us to allow us to get down from the support coach and go and inspect the engine. Um, we got down and went forward um, and um, David Wright, my duty engineer, crawled underneath the engine into the, into the middle engine uh, and discovered that the combination lever and the union link were completely missing. That was pretty serious. As a result of the incident, there were a, 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 some um, some fairly um, careful investigations made. The engine was immediately quarantined. We were recovered from near Sandy, 
uh, we were recovered by diesel uh, to as far as Peterborough. I remember it was a Class 66. It was, a, six, it was a 66. Can yeah. only run at 75 anyway. Well, actually, <laughs> we were running at less than 20 miles an hour because of uh, because of the concerns of, of damage to the engine. Um, so we, we went forward um, fairly carefully to avoid any further damage. And uh, we took Tornado and the support coach off the train at Peterborough. And our uh, friends at the Neen Valley Railway were very kind and um, provided us some accommodation. Uh, for further inspections and, and investigations into what had gone on. And there followed a, a fairly rigorous period of testing. A- absolutely. As initially, the engine was quarantined uh, until it could be formally inspected, which happened the next day. Um, so a team of examiners came down from DB Cargo, our train operator, and made a very careful inspection of the locomotive to ascertain what had happened and what had caused the failure. And um, uh, beyond that, we conducted some further investigations. We wanted to challenge the the quality of the oil to see whether the oil was an issue. And the outcome of the investigations were that a number of factors were at play, um, which resulted in in that failure. Uh, Speed, we don't believe, was a factor. Um, There were some issues over um, some tolerances uh, in the engineering uh, of the middle engine, which had been overhauled that winter. Um, We were concerned about the um, correct lubrication and the oil supply to the middle engine. And we were also, when we tested the quality of the steam oil that we were using, we were concerned that the results, and in particular the viscosity levels that that were reported, were not as they should be. So a number of factors combined, if you like, almost a classic accident. A number of factors which on their own would probably not have caused the failure that occurred. But when they all happened together, it was that perfect storm um, that caused the failure of the middle engine. In fact, what happened was um, the leading valve um, seized in the liner and stopped the valve and the valve crosshead from moving. What, meanwhile, um, the main crosshead was continuing um, at about 60 miles an hour. The, the top of the combination lever was held seized solid and all that could happen was for the combination lever to flex uh, and eventually fail uh, and shear, which is what happened. The combination lever then dropped down until the union link ripped off the, the crosshead and fell into the forefoot. Was this a failure that really could have happened to any loco operating on the main line? In theory, yes. We, you know, Locomotives rely on a proper decent oil supply um, to, uh, to bearings which are in, in, in effect white metal bearings in a, in a bronze bearing. Um, and if for any reason the oil supply to the to a bearing becomes interrupted, um, or the oil is of the incorrect um, the incorrect incorrect quality, that can lead to the bearing running hot. When it runs too hot, the white metal that provides the the bearing surface melts and runs out, which means the bearing fails. And if if that's not detected and the crew don't take steps to bring the engine to a safe speed and eventually a stop then potentially, yes, that can lead to a catastrophic failure similar to the one that we we suffered. And I think what was quite clear to the public was that everything was handled in a professional way, which is indicative, really, of the way that Tornado is run. Yeah, I think I think on the day we were fortunate um, in that the plan to recover the locomotive went really smoothly. It felt an age waiting for the 66 to come and recover us. In actually, in actual fact, I think it was less than two hours from us coming to a stand and blocking the East Coast Main Line to the 66 arriving and then beginning the the recovery, albeit at uh, 20 miles an hour, uh, to Peterborough. Will we be seeing more 90 mile an hour runs from Tornado? Not not in the short term. It remains on. It remains our intention that we have a locomotive that is capable of operating at higher speeds in order to operate successfully uh, uh, in a modern railway, as I've said earlier, amidst trains operating at higher speeds, which means reduced pathing opportunities. So, yes, eventually we would wish to see Tornado operating at 90 miles an hour. So really this um, operation and testing phase is future-proofing the locomotive and its operating procedures? That was always the intent behind why we wanted to operate at 90 miles an hour, yes. So not so much a reaction to a current problem, but anticipation of one to come? Uh, Well, that's true, although that problem exists now on certain sections of railway where it is very difficult and in in some cases impossible to path a steam special uh, uh, around um, high-speed passenger operations. As I understand it, the A1 Steam Locomotive Trust has 
the intention to operate their own train, including the carriages. Is that still going ahead? So it's still an aspiration. A large cost of operating our own tours is the hire of the rolling stock. And if the opportunity arises and we can do so sensibly, uh, then the opportunity to own all or part of our own train is something which we are considering. Soon, hopefully, we're going to see another locomotive emerge from Darlington Works, the P2. Indeed, P2, the Prince of Wales, is is well on its way. Recently, we announced that we've placed the order for uh, the boiler for the P2. In fact, we've placed the order for two boilers. Um, and so we will be operating two locomotives with the luxury of having a spare boiler. Um, the intent being that whilst both engines are in traffic, um, the, th the spare boiler is away being overhauled, ready to be put back onto the first locomotive that's due a major overhaul. Um, that'll reduce the downtime. The biggest, the, the, the biggest challenge of an overhaul is getting the boiler out, sending it away or getting it overhauled, bringing it back and putting it onto the locomotive. If we have a spare boiler, um, then that reduces significantly the amount of time it takes to overhaul the locomotive and get it back into traffic. It's definitely the Achilles heel of any overhaul. It's certainly, it, it's it's the longest pole in the tent in that respect, yes. Um, but it'll certainly be an interesting locomotive to see out and about on the main line. Um, and we look forward to some of the challenges of uh, the Devon Banks or, or the Scottish Hills uh, and, and taking it forward. We've been told many times that A1s don't climb hills is a phrase that um, echoes around the A1 Steam Locomotive Trust frequently. I think um, recent, recent runs uh, and some of the trains that we've done have proved that not to be the case. We're soon going to have the chance to see the P2 and the A1 operating alongside each other, which will offer an interesting comparison. The P2 and the A1 never having seen each other uh, in BR days. What do you think will be the best moment for you when the P2 finally gets into steam? Well, it would be nice to double head with the A1 and the P2 at the head of a train. But I think, I think um, the potential of operating our own train um, with the A1 taking the train north to York handing over the train to the P2, which then takes it on to Edinburgh or beyond. I think that's a really exciting prospect. Absolutely. Hugh, thanks so much for coming on the show. There you are. Somebody else is letting us know that they're here. <laughs> thanks, Tornado. Hope to see you again soon. Corwin, thank you very much. Massive thanks to Hugh for coming on the podcast and for showing me around Tornado. It was fantastic. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, why not get in touch? Our Facebook page is at Railway Mania Net, as is our Twitter. And the Instagram is Railway Mania. Alternatively, you can go to railwaymania.net and there's a contact form on the website. Coming soon, I've got plenty of episodes in the works on various different topics. I'm hoping to release them at fairly regular intervals, so please subscribe. Thanks again for listening in.